Hello everyone, welcome to the Understanding Family Separation webinar. My name is Jonathan Moya and I am the Executive Director of Border Perspective. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. We uh, know that this is a timely and very important conversation, especially for us, people of faith who are trying to understand what is our role? How do we respond to uh, these headlines that we see all over? And so um, I um, was delighted to have and be joined by a great panelist uh, to have this very important conversation conversation and so um, happy to introduce Gina Thomas. Gina is a writer and an author and her most recent book is Separated by the Border, a birth mother, a foster mother, and a migrant's child 3,000 mile journey. So I recommend you guys check that out as a great resource especially around this topic. We also had Jennifer Podkohl and she is the Vice President of Policy advocacy and a lawyer at Kids in Need of Defense. And lastly, we were also joined by Hannah Vigner Ho. And so she is the Director of National Immigration Programs at World Relief. And so we had a fantastic and very insightful conversation around the topic of family separation. So I encourage you all to just watch fully and there's a lot just of really good, good insight. So without further ado, let's just jump right into the conversation. So during the height of the zero tolerance policy, even though kind generally only per provides counsel to kids who arrive unaccompanied, so are arriving without their parents. You know, it was such a crisis and, uh, you know, such an important issue that we actually sent attorneys to the border. You know, we started working supporting the uh, separated parents. And we actually now have a full family separation team, so attorneys that are dedicated to only serving kids who have been separated by the U.S. government. And sadly, we still have very large numbers of cases. So, and then um, my name's Hannah Vickner Howe, and I am new to World Relief, which is um, one of the refugee resettlement agencies in the United States, but I've been an immigration lawyer a long time. Um, and uh, early on when I was an intern in law school, I was working with um, an agency that um, provided intake and representation at uh, the Burks um, detention facility in Pennsylvania. And my job was to um, sit with the people there and, and kind of write down the intake information. Where did you come from and when did you arrive for the attorneys in the program to, to kind of sort through for representation. And I was working with um, a woman to get this information and using, she spoke an indigenous language. And so using a, a phone line interpreter. Uh, and I, you know, I was very diligently trying to get all the information the lawyers had asked me to get and all she kept saying to me is, I don't know where my kids are. Um, and that's all she wanted to talk with me about. And the, um, you know, I, I finished the intake as best I could and the interpreter on the interpreter line said, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I think I know where her kids are because they had interpreted in a similar language um, in another facility. So I brought this information to the attorney and, and they kind of had to sort through if there was a next connection they could find. And this was um, 2006. So uh, like Jennifer said, we know that our country um, has a history of not stepping alongside immigrant families. And we know that there has, we have a history of our policies um, that don't support uh, migrant families. Well, remarkable. I think from uh, what you all just shared, right? I think that's one of the things that um, even we encounter at the work at Border Perspective, um, we don't, we're not just engaged in, in this conversation or in the, in, in, in meeting the needs of migrant families or asylum seeking families in the now because of something that just started happening in 2016, but we have to realize, right, and that's where education comes in and understanding that, I mean, even I think Hannah, you said back in 2006, right? Like, I mean, this is administrations ago, <laughs> right? And so uh, I think that's that's the foundation of, of, where we, of where we have to begin to understand. And that's why um, the documentary we just showed, I think opens kind of our lens into, you know, this started happening way before this administration. Obviously this administration has taken it into a whole new level, right? Of, um, but, um, but it also, I think it's the government trying to understand and really deal with uh, a crisis 
that it that is happening um, at our at our border and in a different type of migration that maybe um, we haven't seen uh, in, in especially in North America. And so um, next, moving on here, we um, as some of you who are on here uh, registered, you um, were really kind enough and to just lay out some questions and and things that you're wrestling with and that you want to know from our panel. And so what we did is we we took some of your questions and combined them and uh, we're going to do our best to try and, and, and unpack uh, this conversation and help you understand, right, uh, um, and, and maybe get clarity on, on some of these things. And so um, we've kind of assigned each panelist a couple of different questions and um, feel free to chime in, uh, each of you uh, as well, who are contributing to the subject, uh, because we know that there might be a lot of different angles. And that's the, the, the intriguing thing about immigration as a whole is just extremely complex. And the more you dive deeper into it, for those of you tuning in, the more complex that it begin, that, that it gets. And so that's something that I found, you know, in this line of work as well. And so we're gonna try to do our best to just kind of help you understand it. And so uh, the first question we received was, uh, can you please help us clarify how previous administrations, the policies may have caused family separation and how these policies are, might be different from the current administration? And so Hannah, if you wanna help us begin with that. Uh, I can start to answer that question, but I think uh, Jennifer might have some good institutional background uh, about this as well. The um, documentary did a, a good job kind of laying out um, the prior administration and the, the current administration's approach to um, migration surges. Um, Jonathan, you had mentioned that, you know, as uh, in 2014, um, there was a surge of asylum seekers and then, uh, you know, more recently in 2017, in summer of 2018, there was a surge in asylum seekers. And the two different policy approaches um, is the administration's response to, um, you know, how to deal with these surges and what, what the approaches were. Um, the prior administration was detaining families and children, right? Uh, there were specific facilities that were set up um, to detain families together. Uh, and then as the documentary laid out, that kind of came uh, into clash with um, the Flores settlement and, and the, the objections that people have made about children being in detention facilities. Um, what is distinct um, in the more recent um, iteration was that it was a, um, an intentional response um, and the, it was a strict enforcement of the criminalization of USC um, 1825, which is um, illegal entry, and the zero tolerance policy, which people have heard heard talked about, um, that's never really been enforced that way in the past. Um, administrative um, systems have the choice about uh, how to prosecute those um, types of border issues, and this administration chose to um, prosecute that very strictly, and in that, um, we've learned from the Inspector General's report and other investigative reporting that the separation of children was also very intentional. And I think um, the documentary had mentioned, and Jennifer said as well, that this was part of the policy as a deterrent from approaching the border with their children. Well, I think, you know, the there was specific instructions we've seen in documents that have since been leaked that, you know, it was not just 100% prosecution, but specifically prosecute parents. Right, so I think it just shows the level of intent of this policy, that cruelty was the entire goal of it. It was not about border security or management or anything like that. It really was about cruelty just to try to deter. And look, when you have a refugee situation, you can't deter away a refugee situation, right? When it's a true refugee crisis, like there is right now in some of these countries in Central America, you can't deter it away, right? So even tearing babies from their parents' arms didn't stop people from coming. Right, because what they were leaving was far worse than that. Yeah, exactly. That's, and that's. I think that's the hard thing. Um, in the last few years, we've encountered many, many of the families that are coming, and I think the, one of the greatest misconceptions that, that that I face is that there's a there's a lot of mothers, and and most importantly, there's a lot of children. I mean, children, babies. Right, and and that just tugs on my heart because I mentioned earlier when this uh, webinar started, I'm I'm a father of a two-year-old, right, and and many of us have little kids in our families, and 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 it's just hard. Um, 
Jennifer, um, so what do we know about the initial family separation pilot program? Um, I know that there's a lot of numbers um, out there, right? And uh, specifically um, the number of um, children that have been separated overall, maybe since the pilot program started, uh, was it only a fraction of, you know, there's, there's a number of 5,500 out there. There's, um, it's said that maybe only a thousand children were separated during this pilot program and many others, maybe the 4,500 remaining have been separated uh, from then up until now, even though we know that the current administration, you know, signed an executive uh, order to stop family separation, but we know, also know that that has been continuing. Can you help us understand that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, everybody wants these numbers, and I think the real tragedy of this is because the government didn't keep track, mm -hmm. um, and everything has been um, so um, secretive. We don't have Right, all the exact numbers, just like we don't have, even have the exact numbers of how many kids are being um, turned away right now under, you know, this Title 42 order where they've closed the border. Um, so, you know, there are a few things. So we had this, the, the zero tolerance policy, right, when they said we're going to do 100% of the prosecutions, right? So that started at a certain point, and then it was, you know, ended the with the executive order. But what the executive order did, it only ended zero tolerance. So it only was saying, okay, we'll stop 100% of the prosecutions. We'll stop that. That's all it said. It didn't say we're gonna stop separations. And I think there's been a lot of confusion about that. You know, and then the ACLU took the government to court, right? And, you know, ordered to get an order for, to put these families back together. But again, the judge's order was powerful, but it's very limited, right? It was just applies to those people that fit in that window when zero tolerance started and the executive order. Now we know there was a pilot program to test out this policy before that. We knew there were separations before that. And we know separations have continued after. So I think this is where we get confused with what are the numbers, because we have a sense of during that time from the you know, beginning of zero tolerance and the executive order, but there's other separations that have happened. So the government was only mandated by the Mizell litigation to reunify the families kind of in this sense, right? So the pilot program, this is the number that everyone's been seeing in the past few weeks, 545, right? Of um, kids who can't find their parents, right? Because they were part of this. So they were part of this class that the judge had ordered the government be responsible for. So those 545, it's been up to nonprofit groups, right, like KIND, Women's Refugee Commission, and Justice in Motion, to be out there, not with any government financial support, trying to find these parents, right, calling them, trying to find them, trying to figure out where they are because the kids are still here and those parents have been deported. So I don't know if that exactly answers the question. I, mean, I can't give you a clean number, but I think, you know, because I can't do that, I think really speaks volumes to the problems we still have at hand. Yes, I think, and and I think we're a, a society, right, in a culture that that oftentimes, you know, really we look for the facts, we look for the black and the white uh, and things, and so I think that even this is hard to unpack because, as you mentioned at the beginning, it, the fact that there was not a record keeping system is uh, one of the reasons why we're in the place that we are right now. And so that's why this is such a mess, really, you know, and so um, as, as in the last week, right, so the news broke that 545 children, um, you know, still haven't um, reconnected with their parents. And um, there's a, a lot of news um, and headlines since, you know, uh, that news broke. And so one of those things is that um, many believe and, and, and even there's been, I think, some declarations that um, maybe the children were not necessarily brought and separated directly from their parents, but were brought in maybe even by being smuggled or brought in by coyotes or um, separated for different reasons from maybe that caretaker person that they came with. And so um, can you guys talk to us a little bit about that? Like how true is that? Are there, are those misconceptions? Um, how does, from a legal you know, system, how, do, how does that happen? What do we know about that? Um, you know, this idea of who, who's bringing these children, specifically this 545. So, you know, like I said at the beginning, kind represents unaccompanied children, right? So an unaccompanied child under U.S. law is a child who arrives at, you know, port of entry or at the border without their parent or legal guardian. 
that's a whole separate category of kids and they're treated differently. There's special procedures for them under the law. There's a special agency that's responsible for taking care of them. You know, there are people who didn't have, they could have come with, you know, an uncle, they could have come with a smuggler, they could have come on their own. You know, a lot of these kids are actually, you know, literally on their own, nobody's helping them um, get here. That's a totally separate category of kids. The, the kids, when we say separated child, that means a child who is with a parent or legal guardian. That is a very narrow definition under the law. So this 545 are children who are taken from a parent or a legal guardian, right? So, you know, a step parent perhaps, um, or another family member who got legal guardianship, had gone to court in their home country and gotten legal guardianship. So that specific number, those were not kids that were brought on their own. Those were kids that were brought with someone in the US government forcibly separated them. And from a reunification standpoint, it kind of doesn't matter how they got here because these children have families that they're not with. And so the number that um, uh, the 545 are children that we do not have, uh, aren't able to contact the parents, but that's split down into smaller brackets. Some of them, we don't know whom the parents that they came with were, right? We just can't make the connection between what that is. Some of them, we know who their parents are, but we're unable to contact them. Um, and some of them, um, their parents haven't yet been found, but we know who they are and we're expected to be able to make contact with them. Like Jennifer said, there are legal advocates and attorneys, even in the home countries of these children, just kind of knocking on doors and trying to find the parents, the, um, what should have been done by the government when the families were separated apart in terms of tracking and, and paying attention to um, names and we say A numbers, which is a, a number that um, an intending immigrant is given or an asylum seeker is given in the immigration system, that record keeping just wasn't done. And so now it's, you know, NGOs and, and support agencies that are trying to connect the families. As someone who was trying to understand this, um, I think one of the biggest and most confusing things is that there was a spokesperson for DHS that said, um, that of these, um, a, a large percentage of the 545 um, have been contacted, their parents have been contacted, and they don't want their children. And then I've heard other news stories that say that's a blatant lie. So, <laughs> what do we do with that? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I think this goes to, again, kind of going back to the process, right? So if these kids, right, when they were separated, the parent was taken to be prosecuted under federal law, right, and then deported, right? Then the kid is here, and then the kid is told, okay, well, you have a right to ask for protection here in the United States if you don't feel safe going back, right? So in some instances, the parent may be in home country, the parent may be here. When a parent's already deported, they can't just walk back up and knock on the door and say, oh, hey, by the way, you took my kid the last time I was here. I would like to get them back. They can't do that. There's no mechanism for, that, for them to do that. And in fact, they could be subject to a, you know, a stricter criminal penalty for doing that. So it's disingenuous to say, oh, sure, it's as if they, all they have to do is just pick up the phone and ask for their kid back and we'll get them the kid back. There's no mechanism for them to do that. Also, by the time we got the information, for the parents, right? So the steering committee, right, folks were working, you know, furiously trying to put these families back together again. By the time we got the information of the kids who had been separated during the pilot project, those parents had been deported two years earlier, right? And if these are people who are not safe in their home country, it's not safe for them to be visible, have their phone and, you know, phone number in a phone book and tell everybody where they are. So they've had to go underground. So it was almost impossible for us, to, you know, it was an impossible, task for the government to expect us to be able to find those people so long afterwards. Thanks for explaining that. That really helps us a lot. It's also um, from the perspective of, um, you know, migrating for safety and seeking asylum in the United States, they came with their children to be safe. So, um, you know, it's not as if the parent doesn't want to be together with their child, but they want safety for their child. And if the home country that they're in is not a safe place to be, um, you know, maybe they are, you know, not that they don't want their child, but they want their child to be in a safe place. And that is one of the hardest decisions, like 
can't even imagine that a, per, a parent has to make. And um, unfortunately, like I've been a part of some conversations and mothers learning about, you know, har- having to make that decision. Do we knowingly and willingly, right? Like, do we just go back or is it, do we let go literally, right? Do we become separated uh, from our kids because of how, of what they're running away from, right? What they're trying to get away from. And, and I think that is one of the, the hardest things that nobody willingly, and I, I put myself in those circumstances, willingly would ever migrate just for the fun of it, just because, right? Like nobody wants to take their family on that type of journey. And, and that is, I think for me, that one of the biggest struggles because, you know, we have been faced with um, um, right on the border, right? Um, with, with many of these decisions and families who are navigating this complexity even for themselves. Um, Gina, you, so in your book, um, so you actually got to reunite your foster daughter. And so can you tell us a little bit about that experience? How was it easy? Was it difficult? Maybe elaborate a little bit on, on that for us. Yeah, it was um, a, a very different situation. And uh, I think a lot of people are curious if they can just foster some of these children. And in our particular situation, um, our foster daughter was um, separated, like I said, um, then went into Office of Refugee Resettlement, which typically happens with um, unaccompanied minors. So um, once she was processed, even though she arrived at the border with with family members, she was officially called an unaccompanied minor. Um, and I just want to point out the the irony of that um, and just make sure that people understand that some of these terms don't actually mean what they sound like they mean. Um, and so um, as an unaccompanied minor, she was then sent through Office of Refugee Resettlement um, and was placed into a sponsorship family. Um, that family was, uh, a sis- there was one particular woman who lived in that home who was a sister of her stepdad. Um, and so again, she arrived at the border with her stepdad's information on her birth certificate. Um, he was a legal guardian in Honduras and she was separated from him and then placed into his sister's home in North Carolina. Um, his sister lived uh, with another adult woman. So it was two moms, single moms living in a home. And both of them had two kids who were school age. Um, all four of the kids were school aged except for um, the foster daughter that I had. So Julia. Um, so Julia was not old enough to go to kindergarten and uh, preschool in North Carolina is not automatically free. And so um, she stayed home alone. Um, because of that neglect, which turned out to be visible when she was um, wandering the neighborhood, she was then placed into foster care. And my husband and I were already in the foster care system as foster parents. And our uh, social workers knew that we both spoke Spanish. So when she was found, she only spoke Spanish. They didn't really understand what was going on. They knew that we spoke Spanish. And so they placed her in the home with us. It was just supposed to be for the weekend. Um, ICE and Office of Refugee Resettlement were supposed to get her the following Monday. Um, but that turned into four months of uh, working toward getting her reunified um, with her mom. Her mom, uh, like I said, she was separated um, with her mom at the border prior to entering the United States. So in Mexico, um, her mom had been held as a hostage um, from the smugglers and um, had since returned, um, escaped and returned to Honduras. Um, And so the four months, um, it it took that long just to go through the whole foster care process because uh, there's no way to, once a child is in foster care, to kind of move them out um, into immigration court or anything else. They have to go through the process of of foster care and family court. So um, we had a home study done in Honduras. We worked with the Honduran uh, consulate to get that uh, accomplished. And then the judge was able to sign off on the two of them being reunited. Prior to that reunification, though, because she arrived with no um, passport or um, papers to uh, travel, we had to get uh, special paperwork from the Honduran consulate for her to return. Um, And so then um, it was the day before her mom's birthday. um, We got to travel with her. My husband and I got to travel with her back to Honduras and um, be reunited with her mom and her three brothers. Um, And yeah, it was an absolutely beautiful experience. 
that I, you can read all about in my book. <laughs> if I talk about it too much, I start crying, so I'm going to try not to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, you know, juxtaposed against that, I mean, this happened literally, we got the paperwork um, in, the, in the documentary. It talked about a, a big protest that was going on all over the nation um, not long after uh, the executive order was signed. And we got the paperwork for her that same day that those protests were going on. So we had planned to go, but it took too long to get the paperwork. Um, and so, yeah, it was um, quite a journey and uh, obviously opened my eyes, you know, from the foster care system, which is, of course, eye opening in itself uh, to immigration system, especially with unaccompanied minors. And through that process, I got to meet Jen and Hannah and you, Jonathan. And so it's all been, uh, it's, it's been eye opening. And um, yeah, there's lots and lots to learn. And I'm still learning plenty as we go along. But uh, it was beautiful. And we still keep in contact with her and get to um, kind of see her grow up through pictures over WhatsApp. So yeah, uh, thank you, Gina, for sharing that. I think it's something you can't make up, right? Nothing that that you even knew that that was going to be a part of your life story. And, and, and most importantly, that you were going to have direct connections with people you know, um, that were impacted severely by some of these policy changes that are, that are really impacting people in their legal yeah. situation. Um, so there, there was a question uh, about adoption, right? Is there, um, someone asked, is there anything in place that would allow maybe some of these children to be adopted into a family or, um, you know, maybe, even just in, in a time where they are still finding their parents, or is there any legal support even for families to, to seek reunification? I mean, if children are in the United States, you know, under age, I don't, I don't know necessarily, if adults like us, right, like are still, we're, we're navigating the system that is extremely complex, where, where, do, where do parents start if they're in a foreign country? And, and, and do children have any sort of pathway, right, to begin doing that their, themselves. Any any insight on that? Yeah, just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to someone who knows more than I do. Um, but uh, for us, it was really um, it was it was really our advocacy as foster parents um, that that kind of pushed this in this direction. It would have been much easier for our um, for our county for our social workers to just sign off on adoption. To be very honest, and unfortunately. Um, I have heard of cases where that's happened, um, but we were very particular about um, uh, them being reunited. It was very clear that there was, you know, foster care is set up so that if children are, like they, like they were talking about in the documentary, if children are in abusive or neglectful situations, that they are protected. It's child protection, right? Um, and this is not that type of case. And I think so many of these are not that type, those types of cases. This is not about child protection. This is about um, reunifying children who belong with their family members and their family members are, are, are seeking the best life for them. Um, and so for us, we, we had to go through, like I said, just the whole process of, of foster care to get to make this happen, um, which, which was specific to foster care. And I don't know that that will always be the case. Um, and luckily, the, um, the aunt that our daughter was staying with um, had uh, contact with the mother. And so that's how we got contact. It wasn't until about 10 days in to her stay in our home that we even knew her, her, who her mom was or if she was alive or what had happened. Um, and so really, I think that's, that's one of the biggest cases. I know there, there are specific agencies that help um, with these things, but for us, it was really, um, and I think and I hope that other Christian foster parents, if they are in this situation, will advocate for unification because I think this is, this is quite a telling time um, in, in our lives that uh, as Christians, um, speaking for myself, as Christians, um, this idea of possessing children is often more important than the idea of families staying together. And unfortunately, um, I think that's a stain on our Christian witness because families do belong together. And, um, you know, our, our, our typical pro-life um, talks uh, are really just anti-abortion talks. And as, as sad as abortion makes me, this makes me just as sad, and I hope that it does other people as well. Um, but we have to fight. We have to fight for for families to be reunited and for family strengthening. So, Jennifer and and Hannah, I don't know if you guys know or have any insight on this next question. And um, 
as I've been digging deeper into uh, detention centers, I've been learning more about um, just the prison industry in the United States. Uh, I wonder if there's any correlation in this, but somebody asked how involved is the private prison industry or how does it contribute to the policy of family separation? And there might not be any, or there, it might be even, um, I would love to get your thoughts on that. Well, I can start. Um, you know, I think that understanding the different kinds of um, government custody is a helpful framework for it. So, right, when people are first present themselves or are apprehended at the border, it's Customs and Border Protection. So those are like those little cells you may have seen where people wear, they are given mylar blankets or those cages, like that big holding area where there was fencing, kind of um, breaking up little rooms. That's Customs and Border Protection. And people are not, children are not supposed to be in those facilities for longer than 72 hours. Now, there's been times where they've been in there longer, but generally they're not supposed to be there for longer than 72 hours. Now, if a child is unaccompanied, so they're not with a parent or legal guardian, they're supposed to go to the care of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is not part of Homeland Security, right? It's not a law enforcement entity. It's part of Health and Human Services. And the idea is that you have an agency with child welfare expertise that's going to be responsible for the care and custody of these kids only until an appropriate sponsor can be found. So a parent, a family member, somebody from their community who's willing to care for that child in their home while the child goes to school while they're going through their immigration court case, right? Until the government decides whether or not they can stay here or it's safe for them to return to their home country. That's different than the ICE family detention facilities. So ICE detention is for adults generally. And it's more of a punitive system, right? It's kind of a way of you know, holding on to people to make sure, you know, locking them up to make sure that they show up to court. It's not necessary, right? It's not, it's not a necessary. It's different than providing care. You can't drop off a six-year-old at a bus stop in the middle of the night in Brownsville, Texas and say, go get to your mom in Chicago, right? Or are, provides a different kind of care and custody. ICE detention, on the other hand, is for adults and it's just intended, it's just more of a punitive system. ICE has family detention facilities, so these facilities where they hold these families together, like Hannah was talking about earlier in Berks, um, you know, those are run by private, um, uh, private companies as opposed to the OR contractors, right, that are running the shelters or the short-term foster care programs for kids. Um, I'll stop there and turn it over to you, Hannah, because you can talk more about the family facilities. So um, Jennifer is right that there's these two different avenues of detention. ICE detention, um, especially for asylum seekers, um, she said it's, it's punitive, right? Um, it is not, um, it's, it's discretionary to a sense. Um, ICE has the, um, and the immigration court has the ability to uh, release asylum seekers in the, um, the documentary we had um, seen uh, an asylum seeker wearing an ankle bracelet, which is an alternative to detention, um, a way of um, kind of keeping track of an individual that's here without um, the proper documentation to make sure that they're coming back to court. Um, so in that sense, kind of keeping people detained, keeping people in facilities um, ha has become, you know, it's a policy choice. Um, they're uh, part of the documentary too. There, you know, some of the um, administrative persons were just, you know, the term catch and release, right? That we see somebody here that's seeking asylum and we release them into the United States to wait for their asylum case to process. Um, and the policy choice was we are going to, you know, continue to detain asylum seekers, right? And not allow them to wait here while their case is processing. Um, so that's a policy decision. Um, like Jennifer said, many of the, um, actually I think all, there's no federally run, there's no BOP uh, family detention facility. Um, there are um, some ICE detention facilities that are run by the Federal Board of Prisons, but all of the family detention facilities right now are run um, in contract with private prison complexes. Yeah, thank you for giving us a uh, breakdown of all of that. I think that is something that um, many people don't don't um, maybe understand the difference, right? Of, of of all the different law enforcement agencies and even the private contractors that are 
being hired to put forward uh, some of ex the ones that are actually executing, right? Some of some of the things that are actually happening on the ground. And so to move on to uh, our next question, um, many of us and, and many people are asking like, where are uh, the separated children? Especially when we look at that 545 number, um, you know, are they, are all of them in foster care? Are they with a sponsor? Are they with another family? Um, can anybody shine light on that? Yeah, so those kids, you know, generally it takes several years for an immigration case to go through the system. And that's a, that's a subject for another, <laughs> another panel, another day about why it takes so long and how it shouldn't take that long. But because it does, right, kids could be here for years, right, unless they decide that they want to voluntarily return to their country of origin. So a lot of these kids, a lot of those kids are still here, still fighting their cases because they don't feel like it's safe for them to go back uh, to their country of origin. So, you know, they would either, you know, it's very unlikely they would still be in government custody at this point. You know, generally kids are moved in to live in a home of a sponsor. So they would be living with the sponsor. So that could be a family member or a family friend. Like I said before, they're going to school, you know, they're integrating in their communities while they're finishing their immigration court case. Now, assuming they win their claim for protection, um, which, you know, when kids have attorneys, there's an incredibly high rate of these kids winning their cases, right? Then they're gonna be on the path to citizenship, right? And they'll be our, you know, neighbors and, and business owners down the street from us soon. Um, so that's where most of those kids are. And then some, you know, either they didn't win their case or they chose to return to their country of origin. I have one question uh, on that, Jennifer. Um, is there a, a percentage of, of um, that you know of, maybe there's not, of, of kids who actually, or, you know, that actually win those cases um, when they are um, unaccompanied or separated? And tell, tell me a little bit about that. So, you know, I don't have any good statistics on the kids who are separated just because a lot of their cases are still pending. Um, but I can say, you know, from our program, KIND has 10 offices around the country. We have about 5,000 open cases right now just to get a sense of the um, breadth of our statistics. You know, over 90% of our kids are winning their cases when they're represented by an attorney. But I say, you know, that's a key piece of it, right? Because otherwise, how is a kid, let alone an adult, going to know how to navigate this system? I mean, it's, you know, three different government agencies. You have to go to court. You could be cross-examined. Not to mention it's all in English. You know, it's crazy to think that anyone could do it without it. And not all kids have lawyers, right? Less than half the kids right now even have lawyers. But when a kid has a fair opportunity to tell their story, overwhelmingly, they're winning their cases. And I think what that reflects is that we have a true refugee situation going on, you know, in these countries in Central America. Our humanitarian system works, right? Our judicial system works when it's fair, right? When the odds, you know, when everything is really fair and efficient and a kid gets a fair shot. And that's what we should be advocating for, right? We should be putting resources into, instead of locking up people and separating them, putting resources into the system to figure out how do we get to the bottom of somebody's story in the most fair and quick way. And then we can decide, we can figure out who really needs protection here in the US. In the meantime, um, I mean, do families sign up to become foster parents? Um, maybe for those, you know, Gina, it reminds me of your story. Um, uh, do we, do we, how do we support those who are caring, you know, the sponsors who are caring for those children. Is there, is there a, a way or an avenue where people can get involved in, in this? So I'll just speak real quick to what I know. There is um, a couple of organizations that do do refugee foster care. Um, and I think when we first kind of heard the uh, 2018, or sorry, yeah, the 2018 uh, zero tolerance, um, we heard from some foster parents through Bethany um, there was a couple of pieces in the New York Times from them, but yeah, Bethany has a uh, foster care refugee. Um, it depends on where you live, if you're located to kind of one of the city centers that, that they have there. And then um, the uh, U.S. Uh, Catholic bishops also has um, uh, a refugee foster care program and I think Lutheran um, also does. So there's a couple of places where you can find that out. And I, I have more specific information on my website if anyone is interested. Hannah, um, I'll end with this question and then we have a couple of other questions that we 
that have come in since we've been speaking. Um, what are the ways that uh, people of faith can support, um, you know, um, families who are, you know, are sponsoring some of these children or is there a way, does World Relief do anything in this type of, of work? How can, um, you know, what are the avenues that we can help to maybe advocate for, for quicker reunification? I mean, we understand that policy is lengthy, right? And, and it's hard and it's complex. And so um, I think that's one thing that I've taken away from just this short time that um, it takes a length of time for anything to really turn over. And so, yeah, as um, Gina mentioned, Bethany Christian Service is one of the agencies on the ground that is um, participating with the Office of Refugee Resettlement to place um, children in sponsor homes or in foster homes. Uh, and so their services are, are kind of directly involved in um, you know, what's going on with, with children in the system. Um, and then, as Jennifer mentioned, the, the legal process can be really long, but with support of an, an attorney and a legal, legal advocate, that system can be quicker, whether walking through the court system or um, reunification, like Gina mentioned, um, giving up kind of um, parental rights for children to be adopted here is a really big deal. Um, and so that process also, right, even if parents and families together were to make the decision that a child should stay here in the United States, that legal process is really, really lengthy. Um, and so um, the agencies like Jennifer's Kind that are providing legal support to these families, uh, direct support in that sense, um, is another really urgent way to be involved um, to try to provide kind of you know, direct boots in the mud support to people that are being directly impacted. Policy is a long road. Um, and, um, and as we saw in the documentary and we've heard now, it changes with whoever's making the decisions. Um, so policy advocacy is really important, um, but so is working with directly impacted people because every time they change the rules, somebody has the potential to be hurt by it. And so, you know, walking with those community members um, is, an important way to participate. That's great. Uh, Jennifer, um, how are, <laughs> great, uh, it's, it happens all the time. I know my son just got home from daycare. I can see him running around upstairs. So um, Jennifer, um, talk to me a little bit more about, um, just to end our time here, about the way that you all fund, because um, obviously, legal fees are extremely expensive and so how does an agency like kind um you know raise that support how do you fund it how i mean do you the people you know crowdfund and get together and that's how you are able to provide the legal resources to many of these kids mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question so you know kind of normally when we were just representing unaccompanied kids kids who came on their own you know, we get some support from the federal government. There's a small program, a little bucket of money where they help that. We rely heavily though on pro bono attorneys. So we go out and we recruit attorneys who work at firms, corporations, and we say, hey, we know you're working at Amazon on mergers and acquisitions, but do you want to take a kid's case? <laughs> you know, and they generally don't know anything about this. So we train them, you know, and then we mentor them so that they have, you know, another attorney who's experienced in this area of law to help them through it. And it's been amazing, the reaction from the private sector community wanting to take these cases for free. I mean, they've been putting amazing resources into it. And quite frankly, there's a bottleneck now. There's more attorneys that want to take cases than we can handle just because we need to, you know, help them and train them and mentor them. And, you know, we take that very seriously. And there's still kids, though, that need counsel, right? So it's a little bit of a bottleneck right now. We need more people to help facilitate that. We also, you know, it's important to have attorneys on staff who take the cases ourselves because that really informs, you know, our knowledge of what's going on, our own expertise so that we can mentor the pro bono attorneys. But when family separation happened, you know, that summer and there was such a reaction from the American public, there was amazing fundraising that happened. So because of just people, you know, contributing tiny amounts of money, we had kids around the country who set up lemonade stands in front of their homes and sent us, you know, small checks. Um, we've been able to hire attorneys just to work on those cases as a result of that. So it's really just been so heartwarming. But I think that, you know, really thinking about what, you know, the American public values 
right, justice and fairness. And so this idea of giving kids attorneys is very fundamental, you know, to our notion of fairness in this country. Um, and I think, you know, really thinking about how can we leverage, you know, a few public dollars and really leverage the pu private sector interest in this, we can get a lot for a little bit of investment. So I think, you know, we're also trying to really push this idea of how crucial counsel can be so that, you know, if a child needs to reunify like Gina's daughter, that can happen. You know, if a child feels like they can't go back safely and they need to stay here, that that can happen, right? We need to be able to listen to them and hear their voices and advocate for what's right for them. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. We hope that this conversation was beneficial and it was educational. And uh, we, again, thank you for joining us. If you want to learn more about Border Perspective, make sure to check out our website at borderperspective.org. Thank you again.